is a slow, methodical questioner of state witnesses, I would imagine he will be just the same way today. Oh, absolutely. He's just a real technician, and uh, this will be uh, a methodical uh, presentation. And I uh, am familiar with their expert, and he is uh, someone Please of uh, good uh, back, qualifications and, and good quality. Again, I apologize All right, let's go back to courtroom 5D. Back there, but we have been busy working here in the courtroom. Um, during the overnight, I'm going to ask you my questions. If your answer is yes to any of the questions, please raise your hand. During the overnight recess, did any of you have any discussions amongst yourselves or with anybody else about the case? No hands are being raised. Did any of you read or listen to any radio, television, or newspaper reports about the case? No hands are being raised. Did any of you use any type of an electronic device to go on the internet to do independent research about the case, people, places, things, or terminology? No hands are being raised. And finally, did any of you read or create any emails, text messages, Twitters, tweets, blogs, or social networking pages about the case? No hands are being raised. Thank you very much. Mr. West, call your next witness. Thank you, Your Honor. Vincent DeMaio. I do. Good morning. You may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning. Good morning. If you would, uh, please state your name. My name is Dr. Vincent J.M. DeMaio. And would you spell your last name, please? Capital D, small i, a space, capital M, A, I, O. Thank you, Dr. DeMaio. And what is your profession, please? I'm a physician, a forensic pathology. Do you hold a degree in medicine? Yes, sir. I obtained my M degree from the State University of New York Downstate Medical Center back in 1965. And Dr. DeMeo, would you please uh, outline for the jury your and the court your educational background then beginning at medical school? Okay. As I said, I graduated medical school in 1965. I then did a one-year internship in pathology at Duke Hospital in Durham, North Carolina. Uh, from there, I did a three-year residency in anatomical and clinical pathology at the uh, State University uh, Downstate Medical Center uh, Hospital. Following uh, that, I uh, did a one-year fellowship in forensic pathology at the Office of the Chief Medical Examiner for the State of Maryland. Um, after successfully completing the uh, three uh, residency programs, I took my uh, specialty board exams and was certified as a specialist in the fields of anatomical pathology, clinical pathology, and forensic pathology. Is that board certification? Is that what you're referring to? Yes. A board certification means that you've complete, successfully completed a number of years of training in a subspecialty of medicine, and then you have taken a written and practical exam and passed the exam. And then you are certified and you're recognized by other physicians as a specialist in uh, these areas of medicine. Dr. DeMai, you mentioned anatomical, clinical, forensic pathology. Let's start first with what is pathology, and then maybe some more detail about those other areas. Well, pathology is a branch of medicine concerned with the study and diagnosis of diseases. Anatomical pathologists generally work in hospitals, and they examine tissue that is removed from somebody. If you had a mole removed from your skin, uh, you had a breast biopsy, 
or some tissue, you know, uh, from inside your body or part of an organ removed. This is examined by a pathologist who then tells your physician uh, what the disease is and the ex if it's there, uh, the extent of the disease, and then he tells you what the diagnosis is. Uh, pathologists are generally doctors, doctors. You, you won't contact them because your, your physician has contact with them, and that's an anatomical. The clinical pathologist is concerned with the laboratory studies done on patients in a hospital. If you've had a blood test, a urine test, all of those are done in clinical pathology laboratories. The forensic pathologist is concerned more with the application of the medical sciences to problems in the law. Most forensic pathologists function as medical examiners. That is, they determine the cause of death, what killed the person, and the manner of death, how it came about, in individuals who are thought to have died of violence, such as accidents, suicides, or homicides, or who've died suddenly and unexpectedly, and the exact cause of death is not known. At that time, they may elect to perform an autopsy to make such determinations. And then, based on the circumstances surrounding the death, the autopsy findings and uh, tests done, they'll make a determination as to cause of death, what killed you, and, and manner of death, how it came about. Let's talk for a moment about the uh, professional positions that you've held following the training that you've outlined at this point. Uh, I'm sorry, but I'm having trouble hearing you. I, I apologize. My ears are getting a little well, less sensitive. Let me touch this and see if it's... I'm happy to speak up, Judge. I think I was facing away, but of course, if uh, Dr. Meyer prefers some assistance. We can make him available in case you need some assistance. Sure. I, apparently, we don't have a PA system in the courtroom that amplifies my voice, so I'll just try to be more careful to speak up. And yes, sir. So, Following the training that you've outlined, would you please give us an idea then of the professional positions that you've held? Yes, sir. Uh, after I completed my training, I went into the Army for two years. I was a major assigned to the Armed Forces Institute of Pathology in uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, it was uh, uh, on the Walter Reed campus. Uh, for the first year, I was chief of the medical legal section. For the second year, I was chief of the wound ballistic section. Following this, I moved to Dallas, Texas, was a medical examiner there from the summer of 1972 till uh, the end of February of 1981. In 1981, I became chief medical examiner of Bear County, County Texas. Texas. And for the transcriber, Bear is spelled B-E-X-A-R, the X is silent. Um, so I was chief medical examiner there. The major city is uh, San Antonio, uh, which I'll give a plug. It's the seventh largest city in the United States and a beautiful place to live. Uh, so I was chief medical examiner there from, uh, Mar uh, from March 1st, 1981 until I retired. December the 31st, 2006. Um, for 16 of the years I was there, I, uh, I was also in charge of the crime laboratory. Um, um, I then retired and I went into the complete private practice of uh, forensic pathologists, uh, which I have been doing since then. I'm uh, also uh, the editor of the American Journal of Forensic uh, Medicine and Pathology, which is an um, international journal of forensic medicine. And I'm uh, chairman of the Texas Forensic Science Commission, uh, which is a state agency charged with, uh, I guess you could say, monitoring the practices of uh, uh, crime labs in the state of Texas. Dr. DeMaio, 
You did mention that you were the director of the Bear County Crime Lab for about 16 years. Could you expand on that a little bit? What was your role more specifically, and what did the lab do? Uh, well, essentially, I established it. The, the police department had the crime lab. The county took over when I came there. It started out as just firearms and basic serology and document examination. And then we were one of the first laboratories west of Mississippi, Mississippi to establish a DNA laboratory. And it just does the usual things, you know, drug identification, DNA, uh, um, trace evidence. Did, did some of that work include knowing how to package um, evidence that may have biological or perhaps DNA evidence? Well, yes, I mean that, but usually it's, you just teach the, the, the forensic pathologists. They know that, because even if they have no association with a crime laboratory, that you have to, uh, there's uh, techniques for handling trace evidence, um, you know, in collection, establishing a, a, a chain of evidence and packaging. So if you is it, is it well known that there are certain, certain requirements when you are packaging um, evidence that may contain biological samples, blood, other f fluids that may have DNA that are wet? Yes, you, you have to dry out the material and then package each item individually in paper, because if you if you don't let it dry out, and especially if you put it in plastic containers, the bacteria just love that, and they begin uh, multiplying, and then you get mold, and it just stinks to high heaven, and everything deteriorates. So that's something that's well known in the forensic pathology community. Oh yeah, that's that's standard practice. It's been well known for a while. Um, yeah, I, I'd say maybe about 30 years that I know of. <laughs> uh, back to the work that you have done with the group that monitors forensic labs. I think you said you were involved. Oh, Texas Forensic Science Commission. Yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. What is that work and what does that involve uh, insofar as you and, and other uh, pathologists? Okay, essentially it's a government agency, and if there are problems, somebody thinks there's a problem with a crime laboratory, uh, either an individual in it or the whole laboratory, whether their techniques or whether there's, um, uh, that somebody in the lab is doing something wrong, then it's reported to the, the state agency, and then we investigate it, and then issue a report. Actually, most of the, the problems with the laboratories are actually reported by the laboratories themselves, uh, because they, don't, they want the test to be done proper. So they, they a lot more than half our investigations are laboratories reporting themselves that there's something wrong with them. In addition to the professional positions that you've had and talked about, have you also had academic appointments? Yes, with the University of Texas uh, system, I started out as an assist uh, uh, yeah, assistant professor, then associate professor, and then I ended up as a, a full professor before I retired. And in what subject matter, please? Uh, pathology, specifically forensic pathology. Have you, in addition to your day-to-day -day work as a medical examiner and your work at the university as a professor in pathology, have you published any books or articles, uh, scientific articles, in the area of pathology? Yes, I, I've published uh, 88 articles in peer-reviewed uh, journals. Uh, I think 13 book chapters. And then I've published four books. The first books, uh, uh, which I wrote myself, and it's been published in English, French, and uh, Spanish. Then I wrote uh, a book called Forensic Pathology with my father, who was uh, chief medical examiner of New York City, and uh, he's deceased now. And then the third book was a handbook of forensic pathology, which I wrote with one of my colleagues, Dr. Susanna Dana. 
And the fourth book is uh, on uh, what's called Excited Delirium Syndrome, uh, in, which I wrote, well, the senior author, I'm the junior author of that book. The senior author of that book is my well, wife, who's a forensic nurse. And uh, so uh, we wrote that book on Excited Delirium Syndrome. That's the last one we've written. So. Let's talk for a moment about your work in uh, Gunshots. That was, I think you said, the first book that you wrote, and has it been updated over time? The, there's been two editions published, and the third edition is going to the uh, publishers in another week or two. This week kind of delayed it, but it's going in about two weeks, the third edition. Would you describe for the jury generally um, the purpose or the focus of that book, if it isn't otherwise self-explanatory by its title? It, it, well, basically, it, it, the book starts out uh, instructing people about firearms, and then it talks about firearms, wounds in general, and, and rifles, and handguns, and shotguns, mentions things, how to do an autopsy, how to collect evidence, and what you can do with the analysis. When you say gunshot wounds, are you talking about how a pathologist could, by looking at a gunshot wound, learn such things as the distance, perhaps, from which the shot was fired? Right. Whether it's a contact or near contact or loose contact or distant wound, uh, range, the uh, nature of the weapon, you can uh, tell by the wound in many cases, things like that, and how to describe it and how to document it. Has that been the sort of work that you've been doing yourself um, virtually your entire career? Yes, by, I have a very strong interest in gunshot wounds. You also mentioned, uh, Dr. DeMaio, that you've written, I think you said 13 chapters. Uh, I take that that means in other people's books than your own. That's correct, sir. And how does that work? How would you come to write a chapter that someone else would include in one of their books? Uh, they solicit me to write the chapter. You know, they say, would you please write a chapter on this and that in other books? Are, are some of those books um, a more comprehensive look at forensic pathology than maybe what you wrote yourself in your gunshot wound book? Well, I don't think so. <laughs> uh, uh, usually, uh, it depends. The chapters are not all on gunshot wounds. Some of them are like excited delirium or other things as well. Uh, nursing, uh, investigation of nursing home deaths and such. About how many of those chapters, if you recall, that you wrote for other people's books involved gunshot wounds? I think about seven. Mm -hmm. You also mentioned that you have authored uh, or participated in about 88 peer-reviewed articles. Would you explain to the jury what is a peer-reviewed article? Essentially, it's a scientific article that is submitted to a journal, and when the journal receives the article, they send it out for other people to review to essentially give their opinion whether it should be published or not. So it's reviewed by other people, then it comes back to the main editor, and then the editor decides whether to publish or not. Peers mean other pathologists? Other pathologists, right. Mm -hmm. And if the article is indeed published, does that make it available to other pathologists, other researchers uh, who may want to refer to it in work they're doing, or to perhaps educate themselves as to the body of research out there in a particular subject area. It is. It, it, we have kind of like a central... Um, used to be you, you looked in the library, but now you go on the uh, computers and you can get into a medical library and they'll have uh, the articles listed and uh, usually nowadays uh, you can actually review the article on the computer. But these are, essentially, it's a library. Uh, so it's, all these things are, are, are listed in certain indexes uh, for physicians. About how many of the articles that you have participated in writing involved um, gunshot wounds? 
I think something like 35, 37, something like that. Over the entire span of your career, you're talking about the peer review articles, the books, the chapters, and, uh, and the research that you've done yourself. This, these events, these, these writings, um, were developed over the time that you've worked as a forensic pathologist. Right, over 40 years. You mentioned that you had worked in Bear County as the medical examiner from 1981 until the end of 2006. Uh, during that time, did you routinely perform autopsies? Yes, I performed about 9,000 autopsies, and then I uh, reviewed uh, the autopsies uh, that were done under my jurisdiction, and that was about another 27, 28,000. That meant I read the autopsies and, and you know, said whether I agreed or not. And, uh, and as I said, the 9,000, I did autopsies until October of the year that I retired. Would you typically, if involved in a criminal case uh, involving work that you had done, be called by the prosecution? Yes. <coughs> yes. Uh, you know, of course, when I was chief medical examiner, then I would testify in court about the autopsies I did, I did, and the other doctors testified about the autopsies that they did. Meaning that you had a staff of other forensic pathologists at your medical examiner's office that also performed autopsies? I had four full-time uh, physicians, plus I had one training position. Uh, our office, uh, my office, uh, former office, uh, was approved uh, for uh, a program to uh, train fellows in the field of forensic pathology. There's about, I think, 38, 39 offices in the United States approved to train in forensic pathology. During the time that you were there as a, um, for lack of a better term, a ballpark idea of how many autopsies the office would do in the course of a year? Oh, we'd do 14 to 1,500 autopsies, I would say, and then we'd have about another equal number of 14 to 1,500 bodies that we elected not to do autopsies, just external exams. And you would yourself perform autopsies uh, throughout the time that you were there. Right. I think the last autopsy I did was in October, and then I retired in December. You, you can't work to the last day because it takes weeks, if not a month or two, to complete all the details of an autopsy. So you have to stop a couple of months before. Since 1981, when you began your work at the Bear County Medical Examiner's Office, were you also able to work as a consultant privately in other cases outside Bear County? Yes, sir. And what uh, kind of work would you do in that regard? Mostly civil cases and then uh, a few uh, criminal cases. Outside Bear County, I could testify for the defense as well as for prosecution. So uh, I did a you don't do many private criminal cases, such as like what I'm doing now. I'd run about, you know, two to four years at most. You have been working as a consultant since the beginning of 2007 then, if I've done the math correctly. When you, I'm sorry, exclusively as a consultant, having retired from the medical examiner's right. office. Right, uh, since uh, January of uh, 2007. In other words, you've been in private practice as a consultant since January of 2007. Yes, sir. And the majority of your work is in connection with civil cases? Yes, sir. Does that sometimes still include uh, gunshot injuries, though? Yes, usually it's uh, cases, uh, insurance cases involving alleged suicides, whether a case is a uh, suicide or not. Occasionally you'll get a case of uh, uh, accidental discharge to maybe a, a defect in the firearm. You mentioned that you were in the military. Uh, did you do any research when you were in the military? Yes, yeah, so that's when I started my firearms research. We did uh, um, study the mechanisms of firearms 
and also review gunshot wound cases. We had with micro flash and high speed uh, photography. You see pictures occasionally of like a gun going off and a bullet in the air or something. That's the type of photography we did. But we uh, we would shoot into ordnance gelatin to evaluate different types of uh, ammunition and how effective it was. Uh, and uh, we also, um, when I was in charge of the wound ballistic section, I also had what was called the wound met study. And this was a study done uh, in Vietnam and uh, uh, photographs of individuals who had been injured or killed by different type weapons. And it was an attempt to study the effectiveness of these studies. Uh, it was very exciting. I had, all I remember now, we had 50,000 35 millimeter slides in this. And then we had all the cases. <laughs> You mentioned microphotography and began to explain to the jury what a picture of a bullet leaving a gun would look like. Is that right? Right. It's called micro flash. And what it is, is it's kind of like, you know, a flash that you have on your camera. And um, only this flash is very, very quick. And so when you take, you can take uh, photographs of things like moving through the air, bullets going through the air, 2,000, 3,000 feet per second, you can just kind of freeze them uh, when the flash goes off. So would you take a moment, please, and explain to the jury the mechanics of what happens when a bullet is fired from a gun, in terms of what comes out of the gun and when? Okay. The firing pin hits the primer in the cartridge case. The primer detonates and sends a jet of flame through either one or two holes in the primer into the main body of the cartridge case, igniting the gunpowder. The gunpowder then begins to burn. It doesn't explode, it burns. Uh, and it's converted to gas. And then the pressure will be gradually to build up. Now at the front of the cartridge case, you have the bullet and that's kind of fixed in. So the pressure then begins to push against the bullet, to push it out of the cartridge case, into the barrel, and then to be gripped by the rifling of the barrel. And it takes a while, it has to build up. Now during this time, some gas will get around the bullet and will actually get in front of it. So now what you have is you have some of this gas in front of the bullet, then you have the bullet, and then you have the bulk of the gas. Now the barrel of the gun, of course, is filled with air. And as the bullet goes down the barrel, it pushes the gas ahead of it and it pushes the air. It's kind of like you know, a, a hydraulic system. So it pushes it out. So what happens is the first thing you get out of the gun, if you do microflash, you'll see it, you'll get a little cloud of gas, not very big, and then pretty soon after that, you get the bulk of the gas. It looks like a mushroom lying on its side, okay? And in that big gas cloud, you'll, there'll be a bullet, and there'll be unburnt or burning grains of powder. So it's gas, bullet, big gas cloud with, uh, big gas cloud with uh, powder grains. Uh, all coming out in that order. Can the gas that comes out first, is that part of, that's part of the firing process combined, uh, the burning material combined with the air that's in the barrel? Well, it, it will to a certain degree, but that's mostly the larger cloud of gas. What happens is, is it's kind of like you have a column of gas and air being pushed straight ahead. So if you hold the gun against, say, like clothing, what happens is this column of gas and air tears a hole through the clothing. And then the bullet gets to the clothing, and then the gas with the soot gets to the clothing as, as well as the powder. And so that's, and then, and that material, if it's in contact, all the thing after the hole goes through the hole and comes out the other side. If I heard you correctly then, if, if the, the muzzle of the gun is against clothing, 
there will be a hole made in the clothing by the gas first. And the air, right. And the air, followed by the bullet, and then followed by the soot or the, the burning powder, the powder behind it. Right. And that's why blanks, people think blank cartridges are dangerous, are, are not dangerous. You can kill yourself with them. If, if you take a gun with a blank cartridge and put it against your chest, the gas formed will just tear right through your skin and muscle into your lung. And people, you know, kid around and they'll put it to their head, they're going to die. It goes right in. You don't need the bullet to kill you with contact wounds. Let's, um, let's continue, though, with some of your experience and some of your writings. Uh, have you written any articles about head trauma in particular? Yes, I, I, I wrote an, uh, one peer-reviewed article, and then I've written a, book, a chapter in my book on forensic uh, pathology on head injuries. Head injuries meaning such thing as blunt force trauma to the head? Right. I think you mentioned that you also have served as an editor of peer-reviewed scientific journals. Uh, yes, I'm the editor-in-chief of the American Journal of Forensic uh, Medicine and Pathology. Does that work include whether or not to accept a submission for, by a researcher for publication? Yes, I have the, the final say. Uh, I receive the articles, they go out to um, reviewers, their reports come back to me, and then I read the reviews and decide whether to publish or not. Let's talk about work that you may have done specifically for entities outside the Bear County Medical Examiner. With reference to your um, expertise in firearms injuries particularly, have you done work for the United States government? Yes, uh, about, I think about two, two years ago, I, I testified for the uh, U.S. Attorney's Office in, uh, uh, incident, in some incidents on the, uh, in New Orleans uh, during the Hurricane Katrina, where police officers uh, shot and wounded a number of people and, and killed one person. And I testified for the uh, U.S. Department of Justice uh, in that case. And I've done like one or two other cases and such. Have you done any work for the United States Marines? Uh, war crimes, uh, I testified for a Marine Corps uh, in the prosecution of individual charged with war crimes. How about for the British government? Pardon? For the British government. Uh, the Bloody Sunday uh, massacre that, that happened in uh, uh, Belfast. And, years and years ago and the and I have another case going in about another two months in Britain uh, having to do with actually concussion uh, head injury yes. as well the United Nations yes Yugoslavia war crimes uh, reviewed the reports the autopsies to this whether to determine whether they are valid or not. <laughs> and let's talk briefly about some of the jurisdictions in which you've testified as an expert in forensic pathology. I testified uh, in most uh, states of the union, uh, state courts, federal courts. I testified in Canada, uh, Colombia, South America, by video. I was able to testify uh, you know, by the computer and everything. Uh, let's see, South Africa, Israel. I don't believe we've touched them. And that's in the United States in both state and federal courts? Yes, sir. Uh, have you received some professional awards as well? Yes, sir. Uh, from... Uh, My medical school gave me the uh, Master Teacher Award, and then I got uh, some uh, Outstanding Service Awards from the National Association of Medical Examiners, 
the Milton Helper Award from the American Academy of Forensic uh, Sciences and the Milton Helper Laureate Award from the National Association of Medical Examiners. Dr. DeMaio, is your professional background and your peer-reviewed articles, your books and awards detailed um, with more specificity in your curriculum vitae? Yes, they are. I would uh, like to approach the witness, please. You may do so. Yes, yes, yes. I'm handing you uh, what's marked as Defendant's MM. If you take a look at it, please. Yes, sir. Is that your curriculum vitae? Yes, sir, it is. Thank you, Your Honor. I would um, offer then Defendant's MM as Defendant's next exhibit. Any objections? Any objections? Approach the bench. Yes, we may. Defense Exhibit 23. Dr. DeMaio, let's turn to the work that you did specifically in this case? Yes, sir. Would you describe the materials that you have uh, received for review in this case? And if you have notes um, reflecting some of that information that you want to refer to, you're welcome to do that. Copies have been provided to the state, but um, just Feel free to use your notes if you wish. Yes, sir. The material I reviewed were scene photos taken by the police and the medical examiner investigators, photographs of Mr. Zimmerman by the police and some civilians, the autopsy report, including toxicology and uh, autopsy photos, the uh, medical records of the EMS and a clinic regarding Mr. Zimmerman, uh, a witness statement and a transcribed uh, conversation uh, given by Mr. John Good. 911 calls, uh, a reenactment tape of the incident by Mr. Zimmerman, DNA reports, the firearm uh, examiner reports, and the deposition of Dr. Rowe. Let's, uh, what I'd like to talk with you about in terms of your findings, well, let me ask you first. Um, you did have an opportunity to review the video recording of Mr. Zimmerman, in a sense, reenacting the events immediately s surrounding the shooting. Yes, sir. And you've had access to some witness statements. Yes, sir. Have you, to your knowledge, reviewed all of the witness statements? No, I, I haven't because by the nature of this case, it's more about determining whether the physical evidence is consistent with Mr. Zimmerman's account of what he says happened. Because the, the witness statements tend to be, in most cases, all around, you know, vary greatly. So the easiest way to hear is to evaluate the physical evidence that you have on the body and the, and the clothing and such, and then compare it to the statements of the defendant, in this case Mr. Zimmerman, and see whether they are consistent. Uh, you know, if, if you say that the bullet came in the front and the bullet came in the back, well obviously they're inconsistent. So that's what you're essentially doing in this case. And in doing that in this case, would you look at, in addition to what Mr. Zimmerman said happened on the video reenactment, you would look at the forensic evidence, which includes the 
uh, pictures from the autopsy that might show the, the gunshot wound? Would that include looking at the report from the firearms expert who analyzed the clothing? That's correct. The, the two most important things in this case are the autopsy report, including the photographs uh, of the wound, and the uh, reports by the uh, firearms examiner. And then with a secondary, you know, the scene photographs and such. But what you're looking at mostly is the autopsy and, and the you know, very detailed and excellent report by the firearms examiner. So would your analysis include, for example, trying to reach an opinion as to the distance between the end of the barrel and the skin? Yes, sir. Would it also include trying to reach an opinion from the end of the barrel to the clothing? Yes, sir. Trying to reach an opinion what effect, if any, the clothing may have had in the appearance of the wound on the skin. Such yep. things as that. Yes, sir. We'll talk about some of those details uh, in a moment. But some of the things that I would also like to talk with you about today is your opinion of how long Trayvon Martin may have been alive and also how long Trayvon Martin may have been conscious if those are different opinions. They're different opinions because you can be alive and unconscious. Uh, so, um, right, they're two separate things. We'll talk about that more. I also want to ask you some questions about the injuries that Mr. Zimmerman sustained that are reflected in the photographs taken by the Sanford Police Department. Did you have access to those photographs and the chance to review them? Yes, sir, I did. I'll also want to talk with you a little about the injuries uh, that you observed through photographs or through reviewing the autopsy uh, sustained by Trayvon Martin, in addition to the uh, gunshot wound itself. So, Generally, that's the framework of what I'd like you to talk about today, and let's more specifically talk about the gunshot itself and the mechanics involved in that. I know you've already touched upon mechanics of what happens when a bullet is fired from a gun. When you talked about the micro photography and that the puff of gas followed by the bullet followed by the the rest of the gas is essentially the sequence yes sir. so let's talk about um, the evidence in this case would you describe for the jury what you saw when you looked at the photographs of the um, clothing that mr martin had and the photographs of the wound to his skin and um, the gun shot or the, the tattooing that was referenced in the autopsy report. Can you put all that together for us? Yes, sir. The, the photographs show a contact discharge of the weapon against the clothing. Uh, and, uh, and this I agree 100% with the firearms examiner that at the time of discharge, the gun was against the clothing, the gas came out, tore the clothing, there are, there's, a, there's a defect and there's tears from it, there's deposit of soot all around it. And so what you know is, is that the muzzle was in contact with the clothing at, at the time of discharge. And again, this is what the firearms examiner said, and she also did, I believe, some experiments proving that. When you look at the wound in the chest, there's a different picture. The wound in the chest was about an inch to the left of the midline, half an inch below the level of the nipples. And what you had was a circular punched out wound, which is an entrance, but it lay in an area of powder tattooing measuring two inches by two inches. Now powder tattooing 
or marks on the skin due to powder grains that come out the muzzle of the gun. They're, they're not powder burns. People use the term powder burns, but it means a whole bunch of different things. This is very specific. When the powder grain comes out of the barrel, and the barrel is close enough to the body, that grain of powder hits the skin and produces a mark and a reaction, a reddish color reaction. Uh, and these, are called, these marks are called powder tattoo marks. Some people call them, um, use other terms, but the powder tattoo marks. They use the term stippling, but I prefer powder tattoo marks. And this indicates that a grain of powder has hit the skin and the person was alive at the time. You do not get true powder tattoo, mix, tattoo marks in dead people. And there was a distribution measuring two inches by two inches and a certain density in these tattoo marks. And this indicated that the gun was not against the skin. It was not an in, a half inch away. It was more than an inch and based upon the concentration of the marks and the size of the pattern, uh, it's my opinion that the muzzle of the gun in this case was two to four inches away from the skin. So the barrel of the gun was against the clothing. The muzzle of the gun was against the clothing, but the clothing itself had to be two to four inches away from the body at the time uh, Mr. Martin was shot. Dr. DeMaio, I'm going to show you what's marked as State's Exhibit 96, which is a photograph taken at the medical examiner's office showing the entrance um, wound. It may take a minute to warm this up, so let me, if I might, approach the witness, and perhaps you could point out what you're saying to the jury. Yes, sir. May I? Yes, sir. If you look, what you see is the hole produced by the bullet. And that's essentially a punched out type entrance. And then all around the entrance, you see these all little marks, almost like flea bites and, or ant bites. Not fire ants, but regular ants. Uh, little bite marks all around. And these are powder tattoo marks. And because they're red and reddish brown, that indicates the person was alive. And if you notice, there's a, you know, a, a variation in the density. And there's a measurement of about two inches by two inches, according to the autopsy report. This indicates, again, that he was alive at the time he was shot and uh, that the muzzle was not in contact, but had to be back. Uh, the first time you see powder tattoo marks is when the muzzle is a half inch away. Uh, less than half inch, you don't see tattoo marks. And then as you begin to move the barrel away, the area of tattooing begins to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And then as it increases in, uh, in range, it, your density will decrease. This is a ha fairly heavy density. So you know it's, 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 it's you know, less than six inches and such. And the density decreases until finally the tattoo marks disappear. This, this is ball powder, most probably flattened ball. It would disappear from bare skin at about three feet. But by the size, the density, this is close, somewhere between two and four inches. Your opinion as to the distance is based upon your training and research? Yeah, I, I've done a lot of research in, in uh, powder tattooing uh, and whether you can make valid judgments as to range. That is, what firearms examiners will do is they'll use like usually heavy white paper and they'll fire the gun and they get a hole, and then they get marks around it. And then by the size of the pattern and the density, they'll give an opinion as to the range. Well, this has been used for 75, 80 years, 
uh, to make judgments. But the problem was, does it really reflect what happens on the skin? And I got curious about that, so I decided to, to make a determination. And I did experiments, and you have to use living animals to do it. And, and based on the experiments, I found out, yes, it's valid. The, the, to determine the size of the pattern by shooting against like white paper is valid out to at least 18 inches. So I, I got interested in there, and then I did terminations of powder tattooing from handguns and rifles and uh, shotguns and how far it extends and how different types of powder make such a determination. This is a, a ball powder variant. Uh, so it actually, there's a lot more grains in a cartridge loaded with, powder ta uh, with ball powder. So you have a, a denser pattern and uh, because of the configuration of the, the grains of powder, they actually go out further. So, uh, and I know it's bowl powder because the firearms examiner uh, states that in her report. Dr. DeMaio, the exhibit you just um, published to the jury is now on the screen. And the detail may not be as good as on the photograph itself, but that's in evidence the jury can review later. This is the what you described as the two inch by two inch uh, tattooing pattern. Yes, sir. Is that what helps you be more precise about the distance than just the half inch where you said it can't be less than a half inch or the beyond 18 inches or f several feet where you know the powder would have dropped off? Right. The, the, the thing is, is that. If it's less than half inch, you would see a hole surrounded by dense soot. And you would not see individual powder tattoo marks. Powder tattoo marks begin at about, uh, in the metric system, 10 millimeters. It's about half inch. Uh, and then uh, begin to, you know, the pattern gets broader and broader. How does, uh, sorry for interrupt, how does the pattern get broader as the distance increases? I, it, it's kind of like with a hose, when you have that spray coming out you know, the cone shape, and uh, you know, the farther you get from the end of the hose, the bigger the spray pattern. And so it, it's like that. And, uh, but of course what happens is, is it get, just like the hose, after a while, the water droplets just fall off. And you can spray so far. Well, it's the same thing with the powder. After a certain distance, it loses its velocity and just falls away. Would the clothing, um, it's, not, it's not disputed in this case that the, there was clothing in between the end of the muzzle and the skin. In fact, we have the, the uh, shirts here in the courtroom if it would assist in your testimony uh, with the jury. But the question is, what effect, if any, would the, the clothing being in between have on the appearance of the wound itself on the skin? In this case, not. Because the coating was not between the powder and the skin at the time of discharge. Because the, there was a hole there produced by the gas and the bullet. So don't forget, the powder is behind the bullet. So the the gas tears open the cloth, and the bullet makes sure there's a hole there. And then the powder comes through there. So now if you had the gun, we'll say, six inches away from the clothing, the clothing, you'll have just a little hole. The clothing will filter out the powder to a degree. But in this case, the clothing didn't filter out the powder because the clothing wasn't there. You had a hole there and you had the muzzle against the body, and so everything coming out the muzzle was going through the hole. If the muzzle of the gun had been pressed into Trayvon Martin's chest, even with the clothing in between, what would you see differently than what you see here? You would see a hole like that, and it would be surrounded by uh, a halo of black soot. And maybe 
on the skin uh, a grain or two of powder. But you wouldn't see powder tattooing. <coughs> Because what the coating would do is it disperses the soot. It doesn't disperse the powder. The powder would be inside the body. From a medical examiner standpoint, um, with your training and experience, literally having written the book, is this a hard call for you? No. This is basic, you know, 101. Let's talk for a moment, if we might, about uh, the trajectory of the bullet itself. <clears throat> Having reviewed the medical examiner's report, included the photographs, I take it, that were uh, available of the internal examination? Uh, no, there weren't photographs of the internal <laughs> examination. There was an x-ray, yeah, which is actually better, because all can shift around. Let's talk about the, well, reference the x-ray if you wish. Uh, that's in evidence too, right. somewhere in, in this stack. But also that you know the path of the bullet through the right ventricle and into the lower left lung. Right. What, what the autopsy describes. I'm sorry, the lower right the lung. The I'm sorry. What the autopsy describes is a bullet hole in the left chest, as I said, an inch to the left of the midline. It goes through the what's called the fifth intercostal space. That is, between your ribs you have spaces. Fifth intercostal space is the space between your fifth rib and your sixth rib. So it went through there, and then it hit the sac surrounding the heart, went through the right ventricle of the heart, in and out, and then it went into the right lung. And when you look at the x-ray, you can see the lead core of the bullet in the in sort of the center. And then you see the uh, jacket fragments on the right side of the chest. So the bullet really went from the deceased front to his back and from his left to his right because it went into the right lung. And it started out on the left side. Meaning there must have been, based upon your review of the description of the autopsy, must have been at least a slight um, left to right trajectory. Yes, there, there's some. Uh, I, I can't really quantitate it, but there's some. It doesn't appear radical, but there's that the bullet was going from, to this, from Mr. Martin's left to his right. I wanted to point that out, that left to right, meaning from Mr. Martin's left to toward Mr. Martin's right. Mm -hmm. So that, no, that's correct. It, it, there's a standard way of describing wounds. And when you describe wounds and when you talk left to right, up and down, you're talking from the deceased's viewpoint, not from you looking at him. So whenever you, I would say like front to back, it means Mr. Martin's front to his back his left to his right. In other words, it, it was not precisely a straight-on shot. No, it does not appear so. Let's, let's talk for, uh, for a moment about the mechanics of that shot, putting together the defect on the clothing that's a result of contact with the muzzle, that you believe that the distance between the clothing and the skin was somewhere between two and four inches, not a contact. Um, your understanding of Mr. Zimmerman's statement because of the video reenactment, your work, essentially, your, your task was to determine whether the medical evidence was consistent with what Mr. Zimmerman said happened. Is that That's summary? correct, sir. Okay. Let's talk about that for a moment. First of all, were you aware that Mr. Zimmerman said that Trayvon Martin was straddling him? Yes, sir. And leaning over him? Yes, sir. And that Mr. Zimmerman had the gun in his right hand? Yes, sir. 
And if you would describe then what you know about that sequence of events compared with the medical uh, forensic and gunshot evidence. The medical evidence, the gunshot wound, the tattooing, is consistent with his opinion, with his statement as to that. And the reason it is, is, is don't forget, the simplest thing is the gun is in his right hand. So if you're going to shoot somebody and you're right-handed and you're really close to them, the, uh, there's the natural inclination to, with the twist, the hand, that the bullet will tend to go from the deceased left to his right, okay? But that's a minor point. The most important point is the nature of the defect in the clothing and the powder tattooing. That is, if you lean over somebody, you would notice that the clothing tends to fall away from the chest. If instead you're lying on your back and somebody shoots you, the clothing is going to be against your chest. So that the fact that the, we know the clothing was two to four inches away is consistent with somebody leaning over the person doing the shooting and that the clothing is two to four inches away from the person firing. You may consider in your opinion as well that the clothing was, was wet. Mr. Martin's shirt was described as being damp, that it had been raining that night, and that when it was photographed at the medical examiner's office the next day, it was obviously wet in places. You may also consider that the responding officers found an unopened can of a beverage in the front pouch of Mr. Martin's hooded sweatshirt. This is in evidence as Exhibit 148, an unopened 23-ounce can of a, uh, a fruit beverage. Yes. Do you find those facts consistent with what you saw, as well as consistent with what Mr. Zimmerman said happened? This would tend to reinforce, because the reason that the cold, as you bend forward, the clothing falls away from the body is gravity. Now, if you have wet clothing, clothing's heavier, and there's going to be a greater tendency to fall. And if you have something in the front pulling the shirt down, as you lean over, again, it tends to pull away from the body. So, so the, the wound itself, by the gap, by the powder tattooing, uh, in the face of a contact of the clothing, indica uh, is, uh, indicates that this is consistent with Mr. Zimmerman's account, that he, that uh, Mr. Martin was over him leaning forward at the time he was shot. Let's um, shift gears for a moment and talk about Trayvon Martin's, um, uh, the, the, the mechanics of the effect on Trayvon Martin receiving that shot in terms of how long you believe he would have survived and how long within that time you believe he may have been conscious and further what if anything he could do voluntarily during the time he was conscious whether he could talk or move or be physically active you follow me yes there are three three questions that you've brought up number one is conscious, is the ability to move. That, and this, that is determined by the amount of oxygen in your brain, for which you have a reserve of uh, 10 to 15 seconds. So even if I right now reached across, put my hand through your chest, grabbed your heart, and ripped it out, 
You could stand there and talk to me for 10 to 15 seconds or walk over to me because the thing that's controlling your movement and ability to speak is the brain. And that has a reserve supply of 10 to 15 seconds. Now, that's minimum. That assumes no blood is going to the brain. If you get some more blood going to the brain, that could be longer. Okay? It's going to depend on blood pressure and how severe you wound. The other thing is, and I know the, the answer is kind of getting complicated, not being simple, is that some people get shot and immediately collapse. Some people get shot, don't even know they've been shot, so they can function. So what I'm saying is minimum is 10 to 15 seconds. That's a given, okay? Now, how long can your heart beat? Because I'm using for time of death, cardiac, not brain. That's not relevant here. Okay, cardiac. In this case, you have a through and through hole of the right ventricle, and then you have at least one hole, if not two, into the right lung. So you're losing blood. And every time the heart contracts, it pumps blood out the two holes in the ventricle and at least one hole in the lung. So you're losing blood. If you engage in a struggle, which is what was supposed to have happened, your heart rate increases. Mr. Martin was a healthy young man. Uh, if he's in a, involved in a struggle, you expect his heart to be going, beating, especially after he gets shot, more than 100 times a minute. He, you, you know, healthy people, 120 in a struggle is no big deal. Now, remember, every time the heart beats, out comes the blood. Now, if he loses, say he's only beating 100, which is relatively slow. If he loses 15, um, uh, if he loses, okay, we got the three things. Say he loses a tablespoon of blood every time the heart beats, which is, well, you got two big holes in the heart. So if you lose that tablespoon, that's not that much blood. That's 15 cc's. The heart's beating 100. You're losing 1,500 cc's in uh, a minute. That's about a quarter of his blood supply. And a second minute, if you could assume the same rate, uh, actually the heart would probably be beating faster for the second minute, he's going to lose another 1,500. Well, that means he's lost more than 50% of his blood supply, very suddenly. It's not just the loss of blood. At that point, he's, got, he's not pumping any sufficient blood to the heart or to the brain or anywhere else, and he's reached the point where he's gonna die. So, assuming these conditions, in all probability, nothing's 100%, he's gonna be dead within one to three minutes after being shot, in this case. Now, all I'm talking about is heart effectively pumping blood. Now, you can still get some electrical activity, but you're not pumping. And this is in all probability. Uh, so, how long was he conscious? Significantly shorter than the time necessary to die because uh, you wouldn't have sufficient oxygen getting to the brain. Uh, I can't tell you exactly how long he could be conscious. I could tell you the minimum, 10 to 15, uh, unless psychologically he just blacks out. So that, that's the best you could give in estimates. Dr. DeMaio, in your training and experience and research, are you familiar with incidents where individuals received a similar or even more serious injury than you see uh, that Trayvon Martin sustained and could still talk, move, 
do voluntary actions for that 10 to 15 seconds? Oh, yes. Uh, best case I have, speaking like a forensic pathologist, is an individual shot in the chest with a 12-gate shotgun at point-blank range. His heart was completely shredded. He turned around and then ran around 65, 75 feet before he collapsed. Does the... Be, does the fact of being shot in the heart itself mean anything uh, other than it has an accelerated loss of blood and that it will quickly deplete the oxygen uh, to the brain because of the, the loss of circulating blood? No, nothing else than that. It, it doesn't cause the same kind of physical response as being shot in the head, for example. Right, right. It's, it's that some of the SWAT teams, uh, you know, if they want to immobilize somebody immediately, what you have to do is you have to shoot them in the head. They know. From what I understand you to say, then, for at least 10 to 15 seconds after Mr. Martin sustained the shot, he would have been capable of talking and of voluntary movement. He could, right. Some people just lose consciousness immediately. It's psychological, it's not physical. But he has the potential for 10 to 15 seconds minimum, right. Mm -hmm. Which could include then moving his arms from an outstretched position to underneath his body. Sustained. Could that include moving his arms from an outreached uh, position to underneath his body during that 10 to 15 seconds? Yes. At the time that one loses consciousness, I take it they then lose the ability for voluntary movement? Oh, yeah. Uh, once you're unconscious, you don't have voluntary movement. And you would not be feeling pain? That's correct, sir. Let's uh, talk for a, a moment about the injury to Trayvon Martin's knuckle. You remember there being uh, in the photographs and a discussion in the autopsy a, an abrasion on the left hand fourth finger? Right, one quarter by one eighth of an inch abrasion. It's great. Do you agree with uh, Dr. Bao that that's an abrasion type injury? It appears to be. Is that consistent with um, having come in contact with a hard surface or impacting some other surface? It's consistent with impacting a hard surface. Would concrete qualify? Concrete could qualify, yes. Sir. In your training and experience uh, under circumstances like this, would you expect to see bruising on the knuckles if there had been punching going on? You can say bruising or you cannot say bruising. It just, it depends what part of the body you punch. You know, the soft of the portion, uh, you may not see it. And then in a case like this, you can have bruising, but it may not be visible unless you cut open the hand, you know, the, the skin, and peel it back. So there may have been bruising there that we don't know about, or there may not have been bruising, but it doesn't make that much difference. You, you can punch someone and not get bruises, and punch someone and get bruises. It's just too variable. Does it take blood pressure in order to get bruising? Yes. When, once your blood pressure goes, uh, then you don't have bruising. That's why they say you can't bruise a dead body. 
no blood pressure. It's, the bruising occurs when the blood pressure forces the blood out of the torn blood vessels into the soft tissue. And in this instance, Mr. Martin lost blood pressure very quickly. Yes, sir. So had Dr. Bao been looking for bruising, especially in the areas of the knuckles, the better course or the better practice would have been to take a look internally. Right, to cut, cut. The, the funeral director repairs it without any problem. As far as you know, that was not done in this case. That's correct, sir. Let's then move, if we might, to the injuries that George Zimmerman sustained. Yes, you, sir. You've been provided photographs that were taken at the scene of his bloody nose. Is that right? Yes, sir. And a photograph that was taken of the back of his head showing some streaming blood. Yes, sir. And were you also provided with copies of the photographs that were taken later that night, some four, four and a half hours later, by the Sanford Police Department. Yes. <coughs> Let's talk then a little about head trauma. Let's talk about the me mechanisms or the mechanics of blunt force injury to the head. Yes, sir. What happens when somebody's hit in the head, either by a fist or has their head impacted against a hard surface like concrete? Well, okay. The, there, what'll happen is, is the brain, the head will move. The head will say, the head's fixed. And then all of a sudden it's made to move or it's moving, hits and stops suddenly. It works the same way. The brain will shift. The brain is kind of like gelatin. And it will move back and forth inside the cranial cavity. And as it moves back and forth, there's three possibilities. One, you get bruising by impacting the bone inside. The brain can come back and hit the bone so hard you get bruising. Or, a variant of it, you get bleeding. You can get what's called subarachnoid hemorrhage or subdural hemorrhage. So you can get intracranial hemorrhage. And if the intracranial hemorrhage is sufficient enough, it can kill you. The other type of injury you can get to the brain is axonal injury. The brain is a mass of brain cells. And they're all connected together, and the connection in part is through fibers called axons that run from one cell to another cell, and it passes uh, down certain chemicals which activate the cells. Now the axons, as I said, are elongated, run from cell to cell. When the brain moves, of course, back and forth, due to impacts, the axons will be stretched to a certain degree. Within limited motion, the way we are walking around and such, or even bumping your head, it's no big deal, because the axons can take that. If the movement is very violent, it stretches the axons. And this causes, this causes injury to the wall. If the, the, the movement, which is more violent, is relatively mild, the injury is repaired by the axon, and there's no problem. And then there's a gradual increase in force until you get something like an automobile accident, where, you know, you, you run into something and your head goes forward and hits the, the panel, say. That force is so great that it will injure these axons and they will not be able to be repaired. And they die. 
Now, luckily, you have a lot of brain cells and a lot of connections. So you can lose a good number of brain cells and still be all right. But at some point, you will have impairment, and at some point, you're going to die. So impacts of the head when it's hard surface like concrete, we'll say, what you worry about is the intracranial bleeding and some axonal injury. More likely the intracranial bleeding than axonal injury, to be honest. And so it's always dangerous. The, uh, the thing is, it's like if you hit your head here on the floor, it's carpet that absorbs. Concrete doesn't yield. When your head hits concrete, your head yields, not the concrete. So it's dangerous. Could you kill somebody? Sure, if you bang them hard enough. But if you, if you don't, but even if you don't do enough to injure the brain significantly, you're going to have some stunning effect. That's what con concussion. You know, you, uh, the, these football players who get the concussion. What it is is it's axonal injury. And, uh, you know, some can take it, some can't. Sometimes there's sequelae down the line. But uh, you can get very mild concussion, just banging your head, uh, not just banging your head on a cabinet, that doesn't do it. But I mean, you know, you fall and you hit your head and you can get a mild concussion. A concussion. You don't lose consciousness, you just appear stunned. I know this is not a medical term, but it's like, Stunning goes to concussion, goes to getting worse. I think the best thing is stunned, where you may not have any significant physical injury to the brain, but you are stunned just from the impact. Stunning is a good term. It's better than concussion. You're suggesting it's a progression depending on how hard the impact is and perhaps how susceptible the person is to it? Yes, and, and how many times, you know, uh, it is, and how much force is used, and but at least you're gonna if you if you get your head hits something unyielding on concrete with sufficient force to tear the scalp, you are going to be at a minimum stunned. And then it could be much worse than that, but you're gonna be stunned because the thing is that we all hit our heads all the time, and how often do you get a scalp laceration? It's not that common. Even in people who have their hair cropped or, like a lot of people in this courtroom, are bald. Uh, you know, <laughs> that removes a little of the cushion. But, uh, you know, the thing is, is when you have lacerations, you know, there's uh, uh, some trauma. Dr. DeMaio, you were talking specifically about lacerations to the scalp. I know that you've received the photographs and reviewed the evidence that George Zimmerman had two lacerations to the back of his head. If I might have the lights for a moment, Your Honor, I'd like to show State's Exhibit 76. This has been identified as the photograph. Is there a, maybe another button to push? The clerk is doing it. Cycle down for a moment. I'll hold it up for you in the meantime. This has been identified as State's 76, the very first photo taken of George Zimmerman that night by Jonathan Manalo. You've seen this before? Yes, sir. Does this evidence some bleeding to the back of the head? Yes, sir. There's two sites of bleeding, you can say. Two. Two wound sites, if you will. Where, where you're bleeding, right. A laceration, it's a tear on the skin. I'll stick that here on the projector, just as a frame of reference. Okay, that's the first picture. And then you later saw pictures where some of the blood had been wiped away. Right.
Let's take a look for a moment at uh, 74. And how well that can be seen, maybe not so great. What do you see in this picture in terms of evidence of injury? Uh, it looks like you've got a bruise on the left side. It's not really a very good photograph. Let me see if I can find one that may be a little bit better. These, these are all in evidence, so the jury can review them at their leisure, but... Um, They aren't in sequential order, so I'm struggling here a bit. Let me see if I can find it easily. If not, we will, we will move on. No, I think we're stuck with this one for the moment. Um, do you see in this photograph what looks like two separate areas of swelling? Yes, if you look in between, you can see there's an injury at, let's see, if you look at the head, say at the... Um, I have a pointer if that would help. Yes. It's the, the top button. That's a better picture. There's an injury here and here, which are, are probably represent the lacerations, since it looks like clotted blood. But if you look right in between, there's kind of a valley. And the reason is, is that this impact site is swollen. And then this is swollen here. So this is not swollen. So you know that there are two separate impacts. One impact here, one impact here, producing two separate lacerations with an area in between that is not swollen. And the swollen is due to, to you know, just a, uh, a bleeding under the scalp. That's what it is. The, the, the knot or the lump that people get after uh, hitting their head on something hard is blood as opposed to some other fluid? It's blood, right. It's, uh, uh, talk for a moment if the you The medical would. term is hematoma, but mm -hmm. not as, I guess, non-medical acceptable. Uh, talk for a moment, Dr. DeMaio, if you would, about the curvature of the head and why you're confident that's two separate impacts as opposed to uh, one impact that could have caused all of the injuries that you see. Oh, well, okay. It's, it's real simple. It's... it's uh, You've got an unyielding surface, so when the circular area hits it, it's going to flatten at the point of contact. And it's not going to uh, flatten three inches on the other side. You have to move it over. And on top of that, you can see if it was one impact, it would be swollen between the two. But here you've got two areas of swelling, so they're separate. You commented earlier that it's not that easy to get a laceration from impacting on a flat, solid object. Yeah, because it takes sufficient force. I mean, everyone bangs their head and it's fallen and hit their head. You don't get lacerations. It's, you know. what's, what's the mechanism by which the laceration occurs, where the skin is split in some way? There's two ways that you can get a laceration. One is if it's a direct perpendicular impact, you just crush the skin. And as you crush it and you push it side away from the point of impact, and you get a tear. The other is if you hit it at an angle such that you bang it and slide, the concrete, or not concrete, the surface holds it pulls one edge, and the rest of the, the moving head pulls against that, and so you tear. A laceration is nothing but a tear.
Here's the picture I was looking for. Let me substitute this. This is Exhibit 57 and see if there's anything else here that more clearly um, shows what you were talking about. Yeah, uh, again, what I was done for. You can see that there's a swelling here and there's like a little valley here and it's swollen here and then it's swollen here and there's a laceration here and this is a blood clot over a laceration. One of the lacerations is almost an inch and the other one is like a fifth of an inch. But the wounds aren't cleaned up when they took the photograph, so you can't say which is which. Is the <coughs> laceration itself a significant injury? In this case, well, just that it marks, it's a marker of force. In theory, if you get a real bad laceration, rarely, rarely, I've seen it maybe twice, people have actually bled to death from lacerations of the scalp, but not like this type of laceration. When you say it's a marker of force, are you saying that it represents something other than just the actual injury itself? Right, it, it indicates that you've had severe force because you've, uh, you've you know, it, it's not like you just bump your head or something like that. Mm -hmm. Would it be possible to have uh, your head struck on something hard enough to ring the bell or stun you that wouldn't actually leave a mark visible some hours later on the outside of the scalp. <coughs> oh sure, that, that you see that a lot in abused children where there's not a mark on their head and then you get inside they've even got skull fractures. So uh, you, can, you can get severe trauma to the head without external injury actually. If That's why they're always doing CT scans, you know, when you have head trauma. So the, the presence of the injury on the outside, uh, are you saying doesn't necessarily mean there wasn't additional impact or that the impact itself was minor? Okay. The, what, I'm, what I'm saying is, is that you can get severe head trauma, but actually without any marks on the head. Or you can get marks, lacerations and contusions, and have head trauma. It, they're not necessarily, you know, more commonly when you get severe head trauma, you have some injury to the scalp. But you can get severe head trauma without a mark on the scalp, too. Uh, sort of gauging the amount of force necessary to cause those injuries uh, alone, would that be enough force, in your opinion, to cause this stunning effect that you talked about? Oh, yes. Uh, anyone who's ever had a real bang on the head knows that you don't have to have a laceration or a big bruise to, to be, you know, it's a transient type of thing, maybe five, ten seconds, you know, you're kind of stunned. That's why that's a good term to use. It, it, medically, the doctors would refer to it as an ultra-mild uh, concussion. But stunning would be a better thing because people experience that, you know, when they hit their heads and they understand it. And it's not really of that much significance if, neurologically. If you sustained a stunning blow like this and then you continued to receive additional blows to the head, would the additional blows continue to cause this stunning effect? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So it may compound in a way? Yes. Uh, it's uh, actually, if you get a concussion, even if it's mild, and then you, within a short period of time, get multiple other concussions, uh, people have died. That, that's the, you know, Friday night football, where they get it one week, and then they get another one the next week, and they'll collapse and die. It's a recognized syndrome. <coughs> so in other words, these impacts could be cumulative just that night into um, multiple stunning effects, ultimately leading to a concussion? Oh, yeah. Well, they, they probably, by stunning, I'm using the term stunning, and I know any physicians listening to me are cringing, uh, because it, essentially it's what it is, it's a very mild concussion. But stunning is kind of more it's, it's not an incapacitating thing. You're not knocked out. 
is anyone who's ever fallen and hit their head hard knows what I'm talking about, the stunning effect. Uh, but it's, uh, you know, you hit your head hard, you understand what it means. There has been some discussion in the testimony about punctate abrasions. Yes, Let sir. me show you Exhibit 66. Are there punctate abrasions evident in this photo? They're right here. It's kind of washed out with the photograph. But you can see, you know, little reddish markings, and that indicates that there was impact with a surface, a flat surface, that was not really smooth, like this wood here. If you hit your head on this wood here, you would not get punctate. You'd have to get something with a little non-flat surface, you know, a little edge to it. Would concrete of the nature that's used in your everyday sidewalk have that kind of surface? Yes, sir. Is this injury consistent with Mr. Zimmerman's head having impacted a sidewalk? Yes, sir. There is some... Something wants water because it's not there for a while. We were just checking to see if you'd care for some water. If you do, oh, just... Oh, no, 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 no. The punctate abrasion is that sort of granular looking red stuff around the temple? Right, it's not smooth. Mm -hmm. It's an area red here, and then a little here, and 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 a little here, that sort of thing. There appears to be a, a noticeable lump or knot a little higher up. Right, over here. Does that appear to be um, a, a consequence of the impact? Right. What Again, would you, how would you describe that? A knot? No, uh, hematoma. It's bleeding underneath the skull. Mm -hmm. Do you think it's likely associated with the um, impact that caused the punctate abrasions? Yes, sir. Could that then be those injuries caused by one or more impacts with the sidewalk? Yes, sir. Let me show you um, State's Exhibit 70, a view of the right side of Mr. Zimmerman's head, I believe. Do you see anything here uh, that would suggest impact with a fist or the sidewalk? You can start to say this is worse than that punk tape, and there's a little lesion over there. It's not a good photograph, unfortunately. So. But again, it's consistent with uh, some impact of some sort. This is uh, another photo of the same side. This is in evidence as 71. Slightly different angle. You can see it. Here's the injury. It goes here. You can, you can see the reddish areas. Let's, uh, let's take a look at the other side of the head on the left side in Exhibit 73. If I might take a moment, Your Honor, and approach the witness so the witness can see the actual photograph. Oh, I can see. Okay. There's no problem. What do you see in this photograph, Dr. DeMeyer, that's consistent with uh, blunt force trauma? Again, you see, this is a washed out photograph, but there, there's an area, there are marks right over here, too. Uh, I, I would assume a print photograph would show it better, but there's, there's some punk tape marks over here. May I approach the witness just briefly, and then I'll return. Yes, you may. Just to show you this photograph itself. Exhibit 73. If you see better in this what was on the projector, could you point that out to the jury? Yes, if you look right here, You can see an arc of punctate abrasions, and then kind of a pallet area, and then another arc right over here. Do you see signs or evidence of a 
um, hematoma, bruising of some sort. This suggestion, but it's not as distinct as on the other side. approach one more time. I'd like to direct your attention though, doctor, to this area above the ear. That, that's the area I'm saying that looks like it's swollen in, in that area, but it's, it's hard to say definitely. I see. <coughs> that's consistent with swelling as a result of blunt force trauma? Yes, sir. That area is this general area here? Right. seen exhibit 79, the first photograph taken at the scene of Mr. Zimmerman's face. Yes, sir. And what signs of trauma do you see in this picture? Well, <laughs> you have to look at the original, but if you do, this appears bruised. But if you look at the outline of the nose here, and it shows up, and there's swelling here, a little abrasion there. Is, is this a better picture? Yes. Maybe I could approach the witness, Your Honor. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. If you look at this, you can see there's congestion in the nose and there's an abrasion. But notice how the outline here is a smooth outline. Here, it bulges out and then comes back. And uh, if you then compare it to another photograph, you see that this is consistent with a possible displaced fracture. Because of the next photo taken of him in police custody, the swell, which is only a few hours later, this swelling is not as prominent. And that's why I believe the EMS thought he had a fractured nose. And uh, you can see there's a swelling right here. It's very prominent. It's just below the area where he's got a small abrasion. Is the injury you see in this exhibit consistent, this exhibit 79, consistent with having been punched in the nose? Yes, sir. This is exhibit 48. We'll put it on the projector and see if you can find the detail. This is represented as the photograph taken several hours later at the police department of Mr. Zimmerman's face. Can you point out to the jury what you were referring to? If you look now at him, notice that swelling appears to be gone. Well, if you get, it can't be gone if it's just blood. So this is strongly suggestive of the fact that he, what he had was a kind of a displaced fracture here and that when he was maybe examined by the EMS or something, they just pushed it back in, either consciously or unconsciously. And so now it's just in place and it's just being held there by the muscle. Either way, whether or not the fracture was displaced or not or even fractured. Does the trauma that you see in that photograph and this photograph consistent with having been struck hard in the face? Right. And so it's there. And then, of course, there's another blow here. I will show you 72 taken that same evening to see if that illustrates some of the other injuries you observed. Is that the part of the forehead you were talking about? Right. It's again another one of these washed out photographs. But um, let me see. You can vaguely see, see there's like a line here. 
And then there's another. And when you looked at the prints, they're reddish markings. You can see this is linear right here. See? Line. And then I don't, this is a crease in the forehead. I'm talking about this coming down. And then right over here. And those are, uh, if you look at a better photograph, there are reddish areas. It's not consistent with concrete. It's consistent with something more like a punch than uh, concrete. So th this would, because what you've got is, if you look at it, the skin is intact. The injury is underneath the skin, this reddish mark. Something that doesn't wash off. Yeah, oh no, this doesn't wash off because you can, it's on multiple photographs. But I mean, it's not, it's not blood, but I mean, it's underneath the skin. Is and, it? But it's not from something like concrete or anything like that. Would it likely be a different impact than the one that caused the injury to the nose itself? Yes, it's too far down and it's not the same thing. In the photograph, if you look more to the right, I'll put, put the pen on it for a second as you describe the photos being washed out. Do you see some evidence there of some mark of some sort? Right, this is it. It's, it's, there's a mark like this, and then there's a mark here. I have a photograph of myself, which is not entered into evidence, so... It's the same picture, is it not? It's the same picture, but mm -hmm. it's kind of... This thing's washed out. So you should have a picture and evidence. Yes, that's Exhibit 72. I'm showing it to you here now. This is the picture in evidence. So there's a separate red mark on the forehead um, that you're pointing out now that, that may suggest additional impact? No, I think this, this and this are, are the same impact. Mm -hmm. I think you have six identifiable injuries. The two lacerations on the back of the head, the impacts in both temple regions, that's four. The nose is five, and the uh, forehead is six. And there may be others, but the photographs are not of the quality um, that you can say. say. May, ha may there also have been impacts that, for one reason or another, may have landed, but didn't actually manifest itself in a visible injury. Right. And speculation. Sustained. In a fight situation where someone may be resisting the attack by someone else, would you expect them, for example, as they are being pushed toward the concrete to resist by their muscles or their back trying to sit up, for example. I would assume so. So consistent with what you see here, is it possible there may have been other impacts, but they weren't so pronounced because there was some ability to actually resist the full force of the impact? Same Jackson speculation. Yes, I, I told you that, you know, also in addition, you know, the head wasn't cleaned of blood in some of the photographs. All I can say is there's definite evidence of six impacts. That does not mean that there were only six, but the six I can say. May I have just a moment? Thank you, Your Honor. Tender the witness. Um, yes, you may. We'll go back to court right now and listen into what the jury instructions are right now. Or terminology, and you're not to read or create any emails, text messages, Twitters, tweets, blogs, or social networking pages about the case. Do I have your assurances that you will abide by these instructions? Thank you, and if you'll put your notepads face down and follow Deputy Jarvis, we'll be in recess till 1.30.
de Mayo, you're free to take your lunch break and um, be back at 1.30, but you cannot discuss your testimony with anybody, including the lawyers. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Court will be in recess until 1.30.